Uh, one more time, Laura Dave, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming. Congratulate! First of all, welcome. Thank you for being here, uh, and uh, congratulations on this awesome book. You've been uh, super busy, I'm sure, right? I just saw, uh, I think it was People Magazine, yeah, that had you on the best summer reads, must read list already. There's a bunch of advanced reviews. I'm really excited about this one. This has got to be an exciting time for you with this book coming out next week, huh? Oh, it's great! It's yeah. so fun. Um, I get to, you know, go around and talk to readers, and that's that's my favorite part of this part of the process, so it's really great. That's awesome. Yeah, you had, uh, I think it was like back in 2015, your last book, 800 yes. Grapes, yes. was also one of the, uh, like heralded as the best summer read of 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, are you having any sense of deja vu this early in the games? It's still too soon to call? Because I, I got a good <laughs> vibe. I feel like it's going to be a good run for you this year. I hope so. Yeah. You know, it's, um, you know, working on this was so much fun, and I, yeah. Um, sat down with bloggers and Instagrammers and really takes place in this world of social media. And um, so it's sort of surreal and a little meta now to see it on social media and um, hear sure. what people are saying. I want to get into that in a second, uh, sitting down with the bloggers and, and the research process. But for those that uh, haven't been as lucky as me and had a chance to read it yet, and for those watching at home, tell us a little bit about Hello Sunshine. Because what's great, I think it's a great companion to 800 Grapes. There's some very like subtle similarities. Girl has it all. Some big secret sort of stuff comes out. But it's its own story. Uh, and it's a, a very fun one. Give us an idea of what they could expect. Um, well, that's it is actually, you know, they're both sort of in the world of food and wine, and um, this book focuses on um, sort of a woman who has it all, Sunshine McKenzie. Um, she has a YouTube cooking show. She sort of, you know, if you think of Ina Garden or someone um, who you love on the Food Network, but of this generation, right. um, she's really, um, she has the dream husband, the dream life, and then on her birthday, she's hacked, and it's revealed that it's all a lie. Yeah. Um, the recipes aren't hers, her marriage is in disarray, and in 24 hours, she lost everything she spent the last decade working for, um, and she's sort of left to figure out who she was before she was pretending to be who everyone else needed her to be. Which I think is something we can all, especially now when you're presenting your life online every moment while it's happening, yeah. you know, we're all guilty of taking a photo and then clicking and taking a different photo and putting that up as though that was the moment that happened. Yeah. But how many times do you do that before you lose track of who you actually are? No, totally. Well, there's that old adage of like, uh, don't dress for the job you have, dress for the job you want. And I yeah. think when it comes to social media, people are posting the life they want you to believe they have. Absolutely. Right? So that's a big thing that happens. Uh, what inspired you to sort of take that angle and, and give Sunshine this profession and have this commentary, not just on uh, social media in our culture, but also social media and how it can impact celebrity life these days? Like, what was the spark that said, this is what I want to follow? You know, I started thinking about, um, I, I, I started thinking about how now, you know, used to think about when you went on a trip with your family when you were growing up and your father was taking a million pictures and you were like, oh my gosh, stop it. Like I need to just like be in the moment for a second and how difficult it is now to ever be in the moment yeah. because there's a million things happening. You're, you're having dinner with people. Um, you know, I was just watching a special um, that was talking about friends and saying friends now would never exist. The television I'm show. I'm sorry to stop you. I was going to say, is it the show or is it friends as a concept? Yes, 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 yes. yes the so show. friends, the show. Exactly. Got Chandler, Monica, the whole nine. Yes. It would never work. Because they would all be on their phones. They would yeah. never just be sitting and talking like that. They would be like, they were, you know, it's so hard to be present now. And I was thinking about that. And so she became the magnification of that sort of quandary. Yeah. Well, that's one of, it's funny that you bring up the whole thing about friends because you watch any of those shows from like the, the early mid or 90s period. Yeah. And even somewhat to, uh, to a certain degree, the early aughts where they have all these different types of conflicts that just wouldn't work in a television show or a movie today. Yeah. Because we have this technology that has happened so quickly, we may not realize it, but like we can solve 90% of the problems that right. Joey Chandler and whoever exactly. had, or Jerry had back in the day. I'm curious, uh, so you mentioned briefly, and I said I don't want to get into it, the, the research process for yes. something like this. Mm -hmm. how, how do you uh, dig, sink your teeth into it and, and find all the different little nuances that you'll use to then inform Sunshine and the story? Well, I love, I love research, and one thing I do at the beginning of any uh, novel is I sit down and I talk to sort of experts in that field, um, people who are involved in this case with the Food Network, um, with cooking shows, a lot of Instagrammers, you know, that food's really important and sort of the look and feel is really important, um, and I try to dig into what 
they feel they're doing behind the scenes, how they're getting into it. And the other thing I do is I talk to, because this book really is also, um, it's really about relationships. And so I sat down with some um, marriage counselors and relationship therapists, um, in including this really interesting guy um, who lives out in California who did the longest longitudinal study on what makes a relationship work and also how it falls apart. So he has the answer. Well, he seems to think he does, yeah. I mean, he studied people for 30 years wow. and saw that um, uh, the number one indicator of whether your relationship is going to work is how often you say we as opposed to I. No way. So, you know, as opposed to, you know, we, I had to move to Boston for his job. Yeah. We moved to Boston because there's an opportunity for us. How many people in the room right now started doing the math in your head? How many times? <laughs> like, oh, crap, did I say we or I that time? Exactly. That's amazing. So, um, so how far, how early on in the process, that you said it's the first thing you start doing is, is you go into the research because that's kind of like your favorite part of the process? Yeah. I love I love the research. I mean, I, I, every novel for me starts with a question. Um, and this novel starts started with the question of how do we figure out how to stay true to ourselves yeah. when it's almost impossible to be present now. Mm -hmm. um, how do you not get lost? And also, like, you know, there was a, there was a study done about um, what Facebook does to you um, if you spend too much time on it and, like, what it does to how you feel about your life, how you feel about your friends' lives. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. So I started sort of thinking about that. And then I take that question and I, I move from there into, into the research. Well, that is one of the really interesting uh, questions to raise. We don't know yet what this is going to do to our culture right. long term. Because mm -hmm. we're all still kind of just figuring it out and experiencing it in the moment. Um, are Were there any things that you looked at that were scarier than you might have anticipated or shocked you? And looking at these studies, like, oh, I never thought it would have that impact. Right. That. Well, one thing is that they say now one in five divorces in the divorce papers, um, Facebook is mentioned. As a as a as a reason for the divorce, either they someone reconnected with somebody, or um, you know, in a variety of different ways, Facebook. Would, I thought that was really notable. That's really one in five. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. But also, I I, I guess I get it because at this point, right, mm -hmm. like uh, you know, before Facebook and all that, mm -hmm. um, it was either you, you found somebody and something in their phone or something. Yeah. Now. But I guess Facebook is how because you're posting everything, people can. Right, you can uh, just be honest. I think is the is the <laughs> takeaway here. Right, just exactly. be honest. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, to that end, and speaking about people being honest, and speaking about uh, specific character traits, I want to talk about Sunshine McKenzie because I think you strike a really good balance between uh, someone who, right up front, right in the beginning of the book, is a self proclaimed like awful person, like mm -hmm. bad person. But as you get to know her as a character, she's just a normal person that's had some extraordinary circumstances and made some questionable decisions. But I'm curious about how you strike that balance between a likable and awful person and how you construct that character so that way the audience can buy into these circumstances but also not hate the protagonist. Right. Well, you know, so she's um, she's one of the first narrators I've had who I knew going in I was going to really stack the chips against her in terms of her character. Um, you know, she's not faithful. We, um, this isn't ruining anything. You see this on the first five pages. Yeah, it's yeah, in yeah. the first like five or six pages. That's <laughs> yeah. how you get to, get you like hooked. But yeah. Then, yeah, she's not faithful. She's a liar. She has sort of really left behind everyone in her past, and this is where you're you're meeting her. So those on the surface, you know, don't make her very likable. But I wanted to start there and then think. That's not so far removed from the white lies we all tell. Right. You know, how we all want to be in a room, what we do to get into that room, what we do to stay there. Yeah. Um, and so if I could unpack each of those things and how she got there, wouldn't that be sort of a fun journey to take with her to get her back to a place where she's sympathetic? For sure. And it is a fun journey. That's kind of what, what's, uh, what's so much fun about the book and what makes it fly by is it's not like a contemporary romance novel by any means. Mm -hmm. We're following uh, Sunshine and her journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and I kept thinking of like uh, like a Jenga tower where like it started off she was a full tower but over the years she's taken one piece yeah put it up top and then other people started taking those pieces with her until all of a sudden you reach this point where it's like she doesn't even recognize herself anymore and it all kind of crumbles and she has to put it back together yeah. um i want to ask you about the setting too of her hometown you know uh one of the things i love is that the the idea of exploring this facade that everybody puts on almost extends even to her hometown where mm -hmm. she calls it like the big show uh, about not being a big show, like, and how they kind of put everything on. Why'd you choose Montauk, and, and what about that place uh, uh, spoke to you for this purpose within the story? 
So I love towns that are sort of on the edge of the world yeah. and sort of in contrast to and, um, Sunshine's uh, story starts in Manhattan, in Tribeca, where she's sort of living that wish fulfillment life that uh, so many people long for. You know, everyone in this room, everyone wants to kind of be in New York, be in the center of things. And so I really wanted to put her past in the opposite scenario. Um, and Montauk is this sort of weird, awesome place where there's summer Montauk and then there's regular Montauk. And so sort of digging into that, it felt like that felt to me like really a metaphor for her, you know, the way that things look on one 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 edge of it versus how they actually are for a lot of it. I always thought those like kind of towns were really interesting. Like uh, a buddy of mine, his parents moved out after high school. They moved out to, um, after we graduated high school, mm -hmm. they moved up to Martha's Vineyard, right? Yeah. And that is a, a, a completely different planet depending yes. on what season you go. And totally. See it. It's so fascinating, mm -hmm. like all the locals and the different businesses and towns and stuff like that. So yeah, definitely makes a lot of sense. And with each with, with each novel, um, my husband and I move to where um, working on the book. So I've I've started no picking way. places we want to spend some time. With the last book, with Eight Hundred Grapes, we went up to wine country, and he's never been so interested in my research as when there were like barrel <laughs> tastings at ten a.m. Lots cool. of free wine. Great. So what is the next book set in like Hawaii? Or that's you know what I really should set it in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. I, th I, th I, I think that's a really good idea. I think the next one's going to be in Aspen. Got to immerse yourself. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, and it's gonna have to be, you know, over ski season or something. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned your husband, uh, and I wanted to bring this up. We were talking backstage, the the movie rights. You guys are currently working together, I believe, on yes. the script for this? Yes, we are. And this is the first time the two of you have worked together, right? Yes, so it's either gonna go incredibly well, or, you know, we'll see. And, but and um, how's that going? How's that process? So, so far, it's been great. So um, we really, it's just been really fun. So we're really sort of supportive of each other's work anyway, and we were each other's first reader and everything else. So it's been a real treat to like have an excuse to sit down and work on something together. That's really exciting. We had him here not too long ago for uh, Spotlight when that yep. was out. So yep. maybe when this comes out, we'll get the both of you to come back. That'd be great. Um, we're gonna turn it over to audience Q&A in just a second. There was uh, one other question I wanted to kind of dive into. Oh, the significance of uh, Moonlight Mile, uh, the Rolling Stones song. It plays a really uh, uh, big role within the book and throughout the book, and I wanted to know uh, if that song plays a significant role in your life, and that's why you chose it, or if it was something you found in your research. So I love music, and each novel I listen to one song on repeat the entire time I'm writing, which is, so it makes me sound like a lunatic. But um, uh, for, like my first novel, it was a Ryan Adams song. Um, that makes you sound yeah. like a lunatic. Uh, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I, I, we love you, Ryan Adams. I'm just... Well, I actually saw him at a bar on 10th Street yeah, short shortly after I finished that novel. And I went up to him, I'm like, I listened to your song um, 10,000 times. He's like looking at me like, oh my God, <laughs> step back, step back away. So I learned I shouldn't really tell people that. But um, uh, with, with Moonlight Mile, I, I really have always loved that song. Yeah. And um, when I started, uh, it was just sort of organically a, a detail that I, that I came up with. And then the more research I did about the song and its yeah. origin, it just happened to fit. So it was a weird way, sort of a weird coalescence of things that, that made that song work for the book. For sure. And you don't realize, and I'm not going to spoil it, but you don't realize, like, you have a, a really great uh, bit towards the end where you kind of uh, examine how that song could or could not exist in today's world. And it right. just kind of makes perfect sense, and it's exactly why it, it is a perfect fit for the book. Um, so it comes out on uh, the 11th, right? Yeah, July Tuesday. 11th. Super excited. Tuesday, July 11th. Hello, sunshine. Everywhere books are sold. Is there an audio book? Yes, no? Yes, audio book. Audio book. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. So there's no excuse. You guys, this is the perfect uh, summer read. I really enjoyed it. I think you guys are going to dig it, too. Uh, it's about that time. We've got some mics in the room. Let's open it up for audience Q&A. Hello. Hi. So which uh, other authors did, you, uh, did inspire, inspire you to make this book? That's a great question. Um, I read so much, and that's why I became a writer in the first place, because I love reading. Um, a couple of authors who I really love, uh, Jonathan Tropper, um, I, he's, he's, he's a great one to check out. Um, and Joan Didion is one of my favorites. Um, Charles Baxter. And every year I reread um, two different books, um, uh, one by uh, Jane Austen, um, uh, Pride and Prejudice, and, and The Great Gatsby. Nice. Thank you for that. Next one. Hi there. Hi. Uh, my question was, uh, with all these different topics uh, that you explore in your novels, um, what is the impact that you wish to have with um, your writing? That's a great question. Um, I think that for me, writing is always about understanding and trying to get to a place where we understand each other a little bit better and people feel a little bit less alone. Um, 
both in the mistakes they've made and in sort of what they hope for. And so here, you know, especially, it's someone who I hope that the impact is people feel like you can always pull yourself back to who you really want to be. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. It's right here in the front row. Hi. Hi, Laura. Um, I was wondering, how did you first get interested in food since it seems to play a large role in your writing? And do you think it will play a similar role in your future works? Um, I love food and I love cooking and I th every recipe in this book I've actually cooked um, and in all the books I sort of um, that's sort of a way it's sort of what I feel like I w would be doing if I wasn't writing um, I would be a, a chef but probably a really bad one because I like to go to sleep at 10 p.m. so the restaurant would close pretty early um, but um, uh, I just think food is really a way that people come together around meals and around um, spending time in that way. And so I, I think it will probably pay, play a part in, in, all of, in all of my books. Awesome. Well, uh, I will say the, the food and everything in this book, uh, it's an absolute delight. It was really a great read. I enjoyed having it with me over the weekend. So thank you for writing this, and oh, congratulations. Uh, guys, July 11th, you can get Hello Sunshine, Everywhere Books are Sold. It's an audiobook. Hey, and for those at home that are uh, following along in the non-existent Build Book Club I just made up, if you read Brad <laughs> Thor's Use of Force, who was here last week, this is an incredible follow-up to that. I'm going to tell you right now, it's the exact other side of the spectrum, exactly what you need. I was very grateful to have this book. Uh, one more time, everybody, round of applause for Laura Dave, all right? Yeah.